Well, thank you, James, for accept, uh, sorry, uh, um, making this short interview with us. We are very, very proud to get you uh, at Canada Recipes. And um, I would love to share with the um, uh, people watching this video online to share with them um, who you are, what are you doing on the Linux kernel, and what your, drives you to this position. I think you have an history, a past that brings you to this position, and we'd love to understand what uh, pushed you to the Linux uh, kernel. Ah, uh, yeah, certainly. So. Um I think my first involvement with Linux was a long time ago, uh, 1993, and in those days it wasn't really as a programmer, it was as a user, because I was a physicist, not a computer programmer. Um, the reason I got into Linux is because we just converted to Unix with Sparks in the math department, and one of the things that we really wanted was this thing called tech to do our PhD theses uh, nicely printed and bound. It was a, it's a you can still find it as packages in Linux. Not many people use it, although I still do. It's a, a typesetting program for, for Unix. And um, when Linux first came out in Slackware distribution, one of the few things that it actually did was tech. And this meant that I could actually uh, buy a small PC, it was 486 in those days, install the 10 Slackware disk series on it, and do my thesis at home instead of having to come into the department and fight for time on the Sparks. And so in the early days, I was just a user. And then after I finished my PhD, ooh, uh, for two years, I ran the computer systems in the math department. And one of the things we did, because in those days, proprietary Unix systems, as they then were, were very expensive. So we had Spark systems. We had a few decks. Um, we had uh, some of the weird and wonderful connection type machines as well. Um, in terms of performance for price, there was a factor of 10 difference between running Linux on 586s finally in those days and running them on the Spark. So for uh, the same amount of money I could buy 10 desktops if I got 586s or just one if I used a Spark. And so we spent a long time just gearing the math department up so that more people had computers on their desks so we didn't have all this fighting over who could use the computer to do their thesis and things. So that was how we got into it. I first got into kernel programming because these were Linux systems that had to operate in a primarily Sun environment and we used NFS mostly for distributing home directories and we ran across a bug in the Linux kernel where the reply was wrong to one of the NFS packets and it meant that some of your files appeared blank. So I think uh, we actually looked at that and that was my first attempt at kernel debugging. We found what the problem is and I think we got it up into the 1.02 kernel. So it's really a long, long time ago. But even in those days, I mean, I moved on to Bell Labs. I didn't really use Linux for anything other than desktop for a while. Um, I finally got into programming when we did a high availability startup, and we needed the SCSI protocol to work for us, and it didn't work very well in Linux. That's how I got landed with being SCSI subsystem maintainer, because of all the improvements we had to do to SCSI. So. So it seems that, uh, from what you are speaking, that the first step is just having the envy to discover what is wrong. I mean, this is all you went up. So is it a, a kind of a recommendation for the newcomers? Because um, for all the people watching us, they may be uh, thinking that I'm not able to do what these guys are doing. So it seems that we are seeing that it's not difficult. It just means starting but watching something that doesn't work and try to fix it. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, that's the way I definitely got in. Um, usually, you have stuff that you're interested in doing, stuff you just want to work, and stuff that annoys you if it doesn't work, and you are annoyed enough to do something about it. So even if you look at my coding patterns today, if you actually were to ask Google what I've been working on, uh, you'd see that it's uh, Pulse Audio, TPM, and obviously all the stuff I do in containers as well, which is technically my day job. But the TPM stuff, although I sell it to my employer, is relevant to the cloud. The reason I'm into it is because I got so sick of USB keys only storing a single key, whereas the TPM should be able to store all of my RSA keys and everything I do on my laptop really safely without any dongles. So I got into it because I wanted that to work. And then Pulse Audio, I've got a really nice um, Bluetooth uh, it's effectively a speakerphone headset. It's one of the UE Boom 2 things. And the problem with that is that the only protocol it speaks is the hands-free protocol. It doesn't speak the headset protocol. 
and pulse audio doesn't work very well with devices that only speak hands-free. So most of the coding I've been doing for pulse audio is just to get this one device to work for me. So again, it's nothing to do with serving the community or doing wonderful stuff or even getting recognized. It's because I want a specific device to work. And that's been my pattern for a long time. Um, and from all these topics, it seems there is from there is no boundaries between all the topics. I mean, there is maybe people in their mind are putting some barriers. I should do some networking or so, or, I don't know, some uh, SCSI or whatever. But you, are, you seem to say that it's pretty easy to go from one topic to another and just to help where there is something wrong and not only doing only a single task. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I've programmed in a variety of languages. Uh, I get teased a lot for the mobile phone I have, which is still a Nexus One, but some of the applications for that phone are either written or modified by me, so I got into Java programming to do uh, programming for the phone. Um, I do do web programming as well, because I maintain my own website and my own DNS server. I'm a bit of a cloud Luddite, so I everything that I run that connects to the cloud is actually connecting to my own cloud server rather than one of the uh, big proprietary ones like Google or Facebook or whatever have you, so I have to maintain all of those. So I also got to understand a variety of web programming languages. I just got annoyed enough uh, ooh, only three months ago to want a bridge between my current internet message server, which is XMPP, which is the old internet protocol for instant message, but it's pretty much dead now. Almost nobody uses it. So in order to make it more accessible to people, I had to write a bridge from my XMPP server to Google Talk, so just so I could chat to people, which I did, but because someone had already written the interaction program and it was in Python, the only way I could write the bridge to use their program was also to write it in Python. So I had the joy of having to learn Python for the last few months, which actually uh, it wasn't much fun. I hadn't realized there was such a problem going between Python 2 and Python 3 until I tried to use two separate libraries and I didn't I couldn't work out what the hell was wrong with them until I realized that one was Python 2 and one was Python 3. So yeah, it's it's basically whatever you're interested in. If you follow your own interests, I found all my life, you tend to do the best work you can. If you're doing something purely for the sake of pleasing somebody else or trying to make a name for yourself, if you don't have the core interest, um, you might have the skill to make a good job of it, but you won't have the enthusiasm to continue it or to explore all of the esoteric features. So by and large, if you look at all the kernel developers here, usually they had an enthusiasm for something before they actually became famous kernel developers. Um, speaking about enthousi enthusiasm, uh, what drives your passion today? I mean, what's on your next challenge? What makes you getting up every day and say, yeah, I, have to, I will do this. Uh, I love this uh, open source world. Um, what would be my task tomorrow? So what's your next challenges and uh, what brings your passion? Uh, well, if you think, what I discovered at this conference is that I should be using uh, one of the uh, Postgres uh, input filters that Keith was talking about to actually eliminate spam. The idea that if the uh, uh, email comes in before you've sent the banner, then you should reject it. And I discovered, just looking, there was a Postgres filter for it that is not implemented on Debian. So that'll be my next job, just coming out of this. Um, but I don't have any overall long-term plan for what keeps me going. It's whatever annoys me or interests me that day is usually what I spend time working on. So even for me, containers was a comparatively recent thing. I didn't really start in containers until 2011. And so now it's theoretically my career because it's what IBM hired me to do. But it's not something I had a long-term plan to do. In fact, I think there's a statement from me just before I joined Parallels in 2011 saying that I'd never work in virtualization, which obviously turned out to be slightly incorrect. Okay. So thank you, James, for attending Canary of CPs. We are very, very proud to get you as a speaker. And we enjoyed your conference. I hope you are taking the same pleasure and uh, maybe having the opportunity to see you next year at Canary Recipes too. Yeah, I look forward to it. I've been enjoying it immensely so far. It's nice to have a plenary conference where I don't actually have to pick and choose the tracks and then get annoyed when several talks that I want to go to are scheduled against each other. So thank you very much. Thank you, James.